Thank you, um, Mr. Knopper. All right, I call to order the um, meeting for the public hearing of objections um, on March the 6th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. on the W.C. O'Neill um, Arena Council Chamber Chambers. And I'll apologize if I slip up or do whatever. This is my maiden voyage as mayor, as the mayor is away today. So I ask councillors and Mr. Knopper and Mr. Spear to keep me in line and tell me what I missed. Thank you very much. And I apologize to you people who are sitting in the audience and have to listen with me. So uh, record of attendance, the, we have all councillors present except for Councillor Heenan and the mayor who is away. Is that correct? And Councilor, Councilor Weir. Weir is walking not in the door. Here. He's wa yeah, he's coming in right now. He usually comes in. If you, do we want to wait a few seconds or just continue on? Okay. So, Councilor Heenan and the mayor are the only two. And Mr. Spear is online. So, then we'll start. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the, um, for the council and the chambers that we're on the unceded territory of the traditional um, Beskatomakati people. And the next thing that we have to do is the approval of the agenda. So I'm looking for um, a mover. Uh, I see Councillor Harlan, seconded by Councillor Hurtle. So the um, agenda is that um, for the 230306 public hearing of objections and comments this meeting on Monday, March the 6th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. be adopted. So, oh, Mr. Weir, I hope you're okay, Mr. Weir, Councillor Weir. Anyway, welcome. And I need, we got the first and second, is there any Ad admissions or errors or omissions? No? Okay. So uh, I'll call for the question. All those in favor say aye. aye. Contrary mandated? None. So it's carried unanimously. Is there a disclosure of, in of conflict of interest? No. We don't have a presentation. So now we're at the hearing of objections. And this is for bylaw number 23-01, a bylaw relating to a tourism accommodation levy in the town of St. Andrews for second reading, BTH C230205. The, the Council of the Town of St. Andrews is holding a public meeting to hear objections and comments to the proposed bylaw number 23-01 a bylaw relating to a tourism accommodation levy in the town of St. Andrews. So I will open it up with that. If you would like to speak, uh, for anyone that's in the audience, please come to the podium so that we can hear you both clearly on the speaker and as well for our online Mr. Spear. So I so open it up. Is there anyone? And please state your name before you start. Please state your name. Thank you. My name is uh, Dominique Berlanger. I live in uh, St. Andrews. I'm the owner of, uh, of the Kennedy House. Thank you very much for, uh, for making this uh, feedback session possible. And as a new member of the St. Andrews community and a proud business owner, I think it is important to uh, embrace and support every initiative and opportunity that local government launches to improve the quality of its citizens, the promotion of its culture, the heritage and the natural resources, whether this is publicly funded or in part privately supported. In my opinion, and obviously that's why we're here, uh, the tourism tax is a mechanism that is self-fulfilling as it creates budgets generated by those who visit to improve and to accelerate the frequency and enrich any potential next visit and to enlarge our tourism base uh, far beyond our, uh, our uh, town borders. 
Now, to my understanding, this tax was brought into play at the start or the height of COVID. And it goes without saying that the pandemic has changed our habits, our businesses, the needs, and especially the way people will travel. Now, I'm also a member uh, of the board of the Chamber of Commerce. And as I understand it today, the mechanisms on oversight, checks and balances, and especially the results, the results of this tax remain a little bit of a struggle, remain a little bit unclear today, if not only for me, then especially also to the public and to those who visit us, mainly my guests. New life is blown into the tell process, as I understand it, and every actor needs to find its role, and especially, and forgive me my bluntness, the spending of our dollars is not completely clear. Now, I'm not implying anything. That's absolutely not the reason why I'm here. But just for the record, um, I understand that money today is sitting in an account waiting to be spent. So that means that my guests, guests from the previous year, not only with me, but probably from other colleagues today present, if not online, uh, will have contributed to that fund. Um, and that money has not been spent, where the objective of that spent <laughs> is to improve and basically make it more attractive for people to visit St. Andrews and increase that frequency, as I just laid out in my introduction. I consider myself also a tax collector <laughs> for some. Uh, and I'm sure that many of my colleagues will agree with me that as a collector, we also get questions. You as local government, as government officials, get questions. What happens to our tax dollars? I get those questions too from guests who tell me from guests asking me, um, you know, HST, that's all clear. We know what that is because that's federally or provincially um, uh, imposed. But, but a local tax levy, a resort tax or whatever you want to call it, is something that is locally governed. And people would like to know, and not only know, but also like to see um, what that improves. And coming out of COVID, I think, you know, it's difficult to explain that to the audience or to guests. What exactly have we done with that money? What exactly did we improve for you compared to last year, uh, two years ago? So long story short, and I'm, I'm not taking too much of your time, um, but I think to ask for more, to, improve, to, to increase the tax rate from three to three and a half percent, as, as low as that may seem, we need to explain that. We need to explain to the audience. We need to explain to guests. And I think, first of all, we need to explain a lot more to our, to our tourists what that tax is being used for. And second, we need to find good arguments why we need more money, knowing that we haven't spent everything that we have sitting in a bank account. And it's not my, mon my, my money. It's the money of, of, you know, that everybody, uh, all of us have raised uh, to, to improve the lives and, and uh, and the visits of our, of our tourists. But then to ask more money and to say, you know what, as of tomorrow, I'm just gonna charge you more. And, and you know, that's pretty easy. It's a, it's a system. Uh, we have a PRS. I can just increase the tax from three to three and a half percent. But in the light of inflation and in the light of everything, people are, co are conscious about that. And, and, and we'll ask, but wait a minute, last year, your rate was three. Why do I pay three and a half this year? So I think, we have two things to do is first we have to explain what we use the money for and let people know what happened to that tax, to the tax dollars that they spend on their bills and second i think coming out of COVID, and it's a lousy excuse but not only because of COVID, i think we should wait uh, and spend our money first uh, before we ask for more thank you thank you mr belanger Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This is the first time I attend a meeting like that. This is also the first time in 22 years that I'm actually part of a community officially, and not just unofficially, since Shamcook has become part of St. Andrews now. So, <laughs> so I don't know the protocol of those meetings, really. But um, uh, since I've been in tourism in San Andrews for 22 years, or the surroundings, 
um, I, I naturally have an opinion on that. And um, as you know, tourism is is very competitive in today's world. Just about everyone is in tourism around the world. So the, our competitors are not necessarily um, just in Shediac or in the Annapolis Valley. I think we're talking here. Uh, everyone around the world who is in tourism today. So, of course, marketing is is a is a big thing. Is an expensive thing. How do you make it popular? How do you attract people? How do you keep people? How do you have people coming back? People coming back generally depends on our, who is going to deliver the promise we put out there in marketing. But other than that, if you really want to play, uh, you need lots of money today. So I, I would like to address, and I I'm, I'm appreciate your point from 3 to 3.5. I would agree with you. I was not going to talk about that. Somebody else has done that. But uh, I'd like to talk about 10.7 in, in, um, in, in the proposed um, bylaw, the new bylaw changes. So when I was reading through that a little bit more, um, I'm, um, I'm, as principal, I'm not opposed to a marketing levy. I think it's very important we need to do that. Uh, around the world, this has been done for decades, where we only just started recently. In some in some towns, in in some cities, uh, you pay five percent, six percent, seven percent, eight percent. Even there, I think with three and a half, we're still in a in a good in a good level. But um, as we manage these funds coming in, um, I my proposal would be that we. Uh, kind of hold off and put in a bylaw by -law through until Talb, who right now is the service provider mentioned here, has their budget presentation. And, and I think with that budget presentation, because all the many changes we have now technically with the town, with the RSC, who is coming in now newly, which of course 10.7 talks to it, I think we need a, a a good working session where we can involve professionals around town, like someone who has not been involved in that as well, to talk about how we're going to do that. If I read 10.7, then for me, it's it's not what it costs us today. I know the cost for this year, it's $28,000 for, for the town, which is going to take out of that. We, we could manage that with that fund, the way it's proposed. But for me, this 10.7 is almost, we're going to give tourism away here. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're, we're prepared to lose control over our tourism dollars because that's 28,000. Next year could be $100,000. Know? Um, so I, I really propose that we, that we hold on on this 10.7, think about it, have a working session with, with, with us here in town council, and with the professionals on 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 Talb on on the board right now, a fairly new board as well, and and work that out and think how we want to go forward uh, together with with town, with service provider, uh, and with the RSC. Um, and it it just it just sounds to me we're prepared to give the money away which the town, the the members of the town, the business of the town collect, and prepared to lose that money and just give it to somebody else to take care of it. I believe that in St. Andrews, in the, the region of, of Charlotte County, St. Andrews is, is the tourism place, is the center of tourism. So I think we should claim competence there and go for it and see that we are maybe the elected people to take a, to care about tourism in this region and then reach out. The reason why I bring that forward, I can tell you that that's what Fredericton has done. Uh, the, um, the DMO, the, the the um, destination marketing organization in Fredericton, who is um, <coughs> is funded by their three and a half percent plus money from the town, plus money from a third source, so they get even more money. Money is not taken away out of that thing. They went out and uh, have a five-year deal with their uh, with their uh, regional service commission to take care of of tourism in Fredericton and the surroundings. So they have said, we're, we're, the, we're the champions here. We're going to take it on. We want to be the ones who are organizing that. Because remember, 
there shouldn't be any uh, layover, right? No duplications. So they said, okay, we are the ones who are going to take care of tourism. And then they reached out and went to the different communities in, in, in the RSC and said, okay, what do you need? Um, you know, St. Stephen, there is, the, they say, chocolate town, right? Uh, somebody else might say, um, we do, we have something else, right? Fly fishing, whatever. So that might be on our, um, Graham and Anne might say, might say Falk Fest or something like that, right? So basically what they've done is they embrace the region, they keep the control in their town, they keep the money in town, and whatever comes to it from the region, and then they take care of the marketing of the whole region. So, and because of that, I think, seeing that example, I think 10.7 um, for me here says, we're prepared to give control of tourism away, potentially to someone else. And I think we should keep it here. So we should hold, hold on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnie. Um, your points are well taken, and we have met with the town. And uh, I'm assuming that's who you're saying when you're saying we. Sorry. When you're saying we, are you saying the Talb? You is no, part I'm of the Talb. Okay, us and Saint Anne. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was once. Um, I was able to um, to convince one of the mayors, previous mayors that I should have uh, a St. Andrews official town here, the blue shirt. Yes. The, yeah. <laughs> I, I forgot to bring that along to that. You know, so I, I've always been on Team St. Andrews, your worship. OK. <laughs> OK, for a long time. Thank you very much. I just wanted to clarify yeah, that because, I, I'm yeah. I'm talking about, I, I feel I'm saying, you know, I mean, your town council, we're, uh, I know it's an objection meeting or whatever, or it, I, it's more an input meeting for me. I just I wanted to clarify that for anybody that was listening, because that was a little confusing to me if you were talking about we, meaning council and you, or we no. as the TAL. No. So, um, but thank you for your input and uh, great, great uh, ideas. So, anybody else? Please don't be shy. Your Worship, if there's no others from the floor here, I'm going to just go to Zoom, see if there's anybody from Zoom that would like to speak. Thank you, Mr. Knopper. So anybody on Zoom who's in attendance tonight, uh, please raise your hand if you wish to speak to Council on bylaw number 2301. Another call, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak to Council on 2301. Worship, I'm seeing no hands raised. I will also note to council that we did receive in your packages three correspondence as well as uh, two other correspondence did come in today. You saw them via email. Uh, so those will be added to the record as well, council. All right, thank you, Mr. Knopper. Again, anybody else? Oh, there's one. Your Worship. Yes. Oh, okay. okay, sorry. It, it just, I want to touch on a point of Mr. Ernie. It's just, he had talked about not uh, putting through the bylaw until the TALB um, budget had been presented, but we aren't actually scheduled to go to second reading of this tonight anyway, so there still may be opportunity for that. And uh, accordingly, it's, it's always at council's wishes, but I think if TALB does wish that, you know, if they could get, get the budget to us and, and uh, to council over the next two to three weeks, I'm sure we could delay third reading a little bit longer. Thank you, Mr. Spear. and. Uh... So, Mr. Arney, does that answer your question? We are going to, uh, this is not going to go to second reading tonight. This is just a hearing of objections where we listen and, uh, sure. and get the input from, from the people. Yeah. As, as you can see, I'm not uh, no, no, it's all right. familiar with all the protocols. This is my the first <laughs> kick at the can, too, with uh, being mayor. So um, thank you, Mr. Spear, for that information. And so we are not going to, it is not going to be going to second reading. We are just here to listen and get your input. All right. So I'm sorry, and council sir. We'll discuss in a couple more weeks. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Spear. Okay. Hi, Ken Knight, co-owner of the New Brunswick Bed and Breakfast, with my husband 
Last. Just a just a comment, really, that um, because we are, as my colleagues probably are, we're well into bookings for this year, and if we change to a three and a half percent in April, just as long as you're considering putting in some mechanism that the people we have already booked do not, obviously, we're not going to go back to them for another half percent. So there will have to be some mechanism to account for that when we go forward throughout the year, sending in our our allocations. Um, so I, I can speak to that, Your Mr. Worship. Nopper. So any bookings, if this bylaw passes by council, there is a stipulation that as of April 1st, any bookings taken after that would be subject to the 3.5% if the bylaws pass by then. Uh, otherwise, any bookings that have been taken now, you wouldn't be asked to add another 0.5%. They would okay. be in 3% uh, three for your bookings as now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That was my only comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Knight. Again, anybody else wish to speak? Well, I thank you for coming out. I have to, we have to wait till seven now. I thank you for coming out tonight and uh, for giving us uh, input so that we have um, fodder for our discussions when we do do this. And it will be in a while, as Mr. Spear said. Uh, we are waiting for the TALP to present with their budget that Mr. Ani said. So all of that will be done and then um, we will have our second reading later on. Correct? All right. So, uh, Your Worship. Yes, Sorry, sir. I, I just wanted to clarify that. We're not waiting for TALP to present. We're, you know, they no, still no. have time I'm sorry. to present. I'm yeah. yeah. That yeah. uh, they hurry up, or not hurry up, but if the thing get to us the next couple of weeks with a the budget, then it'll be before final consideration of the bylaw. All right, thank you. I think they are scheduled to come, though. I, I, I uh, for clarification, wrong. Your Worship, they're scheduled for March 20th. Oh, March 20th. So. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I will need a motion to adjourn from Councillor Gumichel and seconded by Councillor Blanchard. Okay, we're done. Thank your, you very your, much. No, Your Worship, you no. actually have to go through the vote. I have to go through what? You, they, you, you've got a first and seconder. You actually have to call the motion. Oh, sorry. I, oh, I forgot to do the question. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. Contrary minded, it's carried. And so we are closed. Thank you very much at 7.55. Is that close? 6.52, sorry. He's got on his computer. Stopped. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knopper. Um, I'd like to call to order the town council meeting on March the 6th, 2023, at the WC O'Neill Arena at 7 o'clock. Um, this is for um, our regular council meeting for the month of March. So the first thing we have to look at is the recording of attendance. And uh, Councillor Heenan is not here and the mayor is not here. Is that correct? Okay. So uh, everybody else is here. Thank you. Um, I would like to welcome and to recognize that we are on the unceded territory of the Beskatomakati people. Uh, the next thing is C, the approval of the agenda. So the recommended motion is that the agenda for the 2303-06 regular council meeting on Monday, March the 6th, 2023 at 7 p.m. be approved as pre presented unless you have anything else to add. Your Worship, uh, CAO Spear noted to me that we do have to go into closed session. So We have to go in closed session yes, tonight? Yes, so I will make sure I get the exact section that we need to go into while we're working on this. But please note, we do have to go into closed session. Okay, I, I, there wasn't at the time. The, but that's just a, a minor um, addition. So I guess we call that a friendly amendment. So I need a mover for the acceptance of our agenda for this evening. Uh, uh, Councillor... Blant, um, Councillor Neal, sorry, and Councillor Mark Bennett. Councillor Bennett for second. Uh, uh, can I have uh, all those in favor? Say aye. aye. Contrary minded? Uh, so it's carried unanimously. Thank you. So, Neal, Bennett. 
unanimous. Okay. And so we have a present, no, we have disclosure of a conflict of interest. Anybody have a conflict of interest with any of the items on this evening's agenda? So there are none. We have one presentation, Alexandra <coughs> Woodworth, presentation from New Brunswick Power on the development of a small modular reactor, reactors at Point La Pro. So, oh, it's Heather McKnight that's doing it? Thank you very much, Miss Woodward. Heather McKnight. Thank you. Um, evening, everyone. I might just give a quick introduction as to who I am. Uh, my name is Heather McKnight. I'm from St. Stephen originally, so I am local. Um, I've spent the past uh, 16, 17 years um, overseas working as an engineer, um, but last year I returned home. And in March of last year, um, I joined NB Power on the small modular reactor project. So I've been working on that um, out of our St. John office. So I'm here tonight just to give you guys a good overview of <clears throat> what the project is and, and where we're at. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with our, our Point Pro operations. Um, usually in a crowd, there's one or two that have been there, so they I can find that bit of that that look of understanding, but um, if there's anything I've said, I am an engineer. Um, I do have a tendency to sometimes go a little technical, so if I do, just pull me up. Sorry, and sorry say, just give me one second. Your worship, Zoom just stop. Just give me one second. I have to reset it. Okay, we'll have to stop for a second. No, that's our all technical right. difficulties, <laughs> I've but our whiz kids are on it. So. <laughs> sorry, Nothing. and welcome back to New Brunswick. Oh, thank you. Nothing new with technical difficulties. I experience them all the time myself. <laughs> Recording in yeah, progress. Yeah. No, no, teams. It's always teams. <laughs> Oops. Your Zoom audience stuck with you, Paul. <laughs> oh, we can hear Mr. Spear. Sorry, what was that, Chris? Hold on a sec. Just want to see if it's. Chris, are you seeing the share screen? Chris, are you seeing the share screen? Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Let's Are we on. ready to go, Mr. <laughs> well, we've got it. Thank um, you very much. Um, so the first slide um, we've got up here um, lists the primary um, drivers behind the SMR project. Um, so what do we have? Obviously, climate change is a huge concern for a lot of people. Um, we've got the the drive to net zero for 2050. Um, New Brunswick is part is going to be part of that. So that's one of the drivers is how do we get there. Um, nuclear power is, is part of the mix. It's not the sole solution, but it's definitely going to be something that helps us get there in addition to the other um, energy sources such as wind and solar. Energy security, that's a big thing now. We all see what's happening overseas. Um, you've got a lot of volatility in other markets. So whether it's oil or gas, um, coal, these things that fuel some of our current power plants, um, prices go up. So, and then you have geopolit or geopolitical considerations that are making it complicated. So what are we looking for? Energy security. And SMRs and nuclear in general provide that as well. Um, cost is a driver. And we'll speak to more about costs in, in a later slide. Um, but obviously cost always is, you know, floats to the top of, of all the concerns, what's it going to cost and so forth. Um, but there are economic benefits to be had, both for Canada and New Brunswick in particular, if we seize on this opportunity, which we'll talk about. And an innovative mindset. So something to mention about SMRs, um, they're not your, your granddad's power plant. The ones that we're looking at for New Brunswick are, are quite different to the standard can-do water-cooled reactors. The ones we're looking at and here, this is something to note that, you know, Ontario Power Generation, or OPG, they're looking at getting an SMR off the ground very quickly. They're a couple years ahead of us. But it's worth noting that the technology that they're going for is not the same as ours. We're going 
we're aiming to be the first province to have what's called a generation four reactor. So it's fundamentally different to the way um, a can-do reactor works. So I think we have a couple of slides that will explain that technology a little bit better. Um, so next slide, please. So as I've mentioned, um, the big target, 2050, net zero, nuclear is going to have to play um, a part in that. Because um, we all know if there's one thing that isn't going down, it's electricity demand. Um, all the forecasts just keep having global electricity demand going up and up. Um, so in order to meet that and curb our emissions, um, we have to do something other than just have solar and, and wind. Um, I'm not anti-solar or wind, I just don't believe that they're going to get us there all the way to net 50. You need solid um, baseload power that's emissions free and that's what nuclear um, does for us. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide um, gives a breakdown um, of NB Power's um, power generation mix. So at the moment, we're actually quite blessed in New Brunswick that um, of the 4,000 megawatts that we're mandated to provide, provide at any given moment, and you'll notice there, February 4th, we had the highest peak demand that we've ever had in New Brunswick, that, that really cold snap we had. Um, we were just under that. Um, there it is. The 3,432 megawatt. So at any given time, MB Power has to be able to provide 4,000 megawatts of power. Now, in New Brunswick, roughly half of that is already considered clean energy. New Brunswick, Canada in general, we have a lot of hydropower, which is great. Um, but New Brunswick also has nuclear, um, wind, solar. We also import a bit from, from both Quebec as well as um, New England. We're, we're linked into the New England transmission grid as well. So this is what we're trying to change. The uh, roughly half of our power production, which comes from fossil fuels. So we have Belle Dune up north, Colson Cove next to St. John, um, Millbank and St. Rose, which I think are up in the Miramichi area. And then we have a, a small gas-fired uh, generation plant in Bayside. So fossil fuel, I think it's 2030 that we're phasing these out. So that gives us roughly seven, eight years time um, to replace it. Next slide, please. So here's NB Power's vision, New Brunswick's vision. So demonstrate these, these new reactor technologies at Point LaPro. Um, Point LaPro is a very advantageous site. New Brunswick's an advantageous site for nuclear because we have a solid operating experience in nuclear. So we've got the, the expertise. Um, we've got the, uh, all the regulatory experience going forward, which really helps us. Um, we're a nuclear familiar province, other provinces aren't, and that, that, that's actually a, a big factor for us because it, it puts us in pole position to be able to bring this project uh, to fruition. So the, the thing about SMRs, small modular reactor, um, unlike big can-do units or other type of nuclear power plants, which are, you know, just really, really large structures and so forth, um, small modular is exactly that. You, you get the size down, it, it's not the same megawatt power plant, it's, it's quite a bit smaller, so we're targeting around 100 to 150 <coughs> megawatt electric, the first unit. Um, Point Pro, when it's going full out, will do about 700. Um, so they're quite a bit smaller, but what that allows you to do is you can design it such that you can construct it in a modular fashion. You can almost construct a lot of it off-site and then you bring it to the site and you can assemble it there. So it makes for an easier, a faster, and over time a much more ec economical way of, of building these. And just to give you an idea of when I say small, how small, there's a little bit of a running, a running uh, gag. You know, a lot of times you'll have, you know, Americans describe things in the, in the size of football pitches. Um, well, an SMR for us, um, the first one will be essentially half the size of the St. John Costco. So most people have been to a Costco, so they know roughly how big that building is. So if you can picture half that building, that's our 150 megawatt nuclear reactor. So as we look forward to the future and we start building more and more of them, so you guys may have heard rumblings or whisperings that there could be more um, potential to install nuclear up north in Belle Dune for hydrogen. Um, and that's the other point worth making is that these reactors aren't just targeted for power production. They're built such that you can use them in other industrial applications. So it really opens the economic opportunity to, to supply power or heat. Heat's a big one, because a lot of industrial processes need steam. 
and they generate that steam. If you take the, the, the oil sands in Alberta, they generate that steam burning natural gas. So here you can, you can actually put in a small nuclear reactor, a small modular reactor, and generate that steam rather than burning fossil fuels. So other industries, chemical industries, mining industries, oil and gas industries, who are also looking to be part of that 2050 solution and wanting to go green, this is, this is something that may help them as well. So whereas a couple of years ago you'd attend a nuclear conference, you'd have 200 people. We had one last week in Ontario, there were over 1,200. And it's not just nuclear people, it's industry people now. They see the opportunity and they're beginning to get interest, interested in it. So it's really exciting. So we have an opportunity here in terms of fabrication, uh, supply chain. I mean, it's likely you'd have bits and bobs um, coming from all over the world, depending on the, what the part is and whether you know an industry is specialized in one jurisdiction over another. Um, but the idea is you can you can take all the parts, bring them together, and then fabricate closer to the actual site. And if we can build that in New Brunswick, we have the potential to to export that as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. Maybe. Uh oh. No, no, just my mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is a, a good artist rendition of what an ARC um, facility would look like. So that, that rooftop there, that's roughly eight meters tall. So it just gives you an idea that it's, it's much, much shorter as well than when you drive to St. John, you see the big containment building of Point La Pro. You probably wouldn't notice the rooftop of the SMR as you go by. It's not high enough. Um, key technical differences here. So when I say that it's a new technology, yes, it's a new technology, but more from the commercial standpoint, not so much from the actual technology standpoint, because um, this type of technology has been around for quite a while. And this reactor that ARC Clean Technology is designing and going to build is based mostly on the EBR2 reactor that was operating, I think, since the 50s. And it sh I think they shut it down in the 90s. So. 30 years of, of solid operation there. Um, this one is worth noting. It's a key difference as well. Um, the CANDU reactor pretty much has a constant um, refueling cycle that happens online. Um, it's very labor intensive. Um, it's obviously you're having to transport fuel, handle fuel, store used fuel, and then put the, the ultimately put the waste fuel in the storage containers at site. Um, the ARC 100 is designed such that you put the, the fuel rods in, you load in the fuel, um, it lasts for 20 years. You don't, you don't touch it, you, you leave it alone. So this is, this is a, a, a major difference. So it's a much safer operation. You're not constantly in there removing and adding fuel rods the way you are with, with current technology. Um, one of the other main differences with this technology is um, it's low pressure. Right, so a lot of the, the systems at, uh, at conventional um, nuclear power plants, they're under a, a higher pressure. So what that means is if you have a, a crack or a leaking flange, um, a lot more of the molecules, whether they're water or, or steam or whatever they are, um, can escape, whereas this is low pressure. So if there is something like a leaking flange, it doesn't, it doesn't actually poof out. It just sits there. <laughs> so it's like, it's very, you know, like a, like a Coke bottle. It's not under pressure. You give it a little shake, you psh, it, it goes everywhere. But there's no pressure in, a, in this reactor, so it doesn't do that. Um, so this is a good picture of it. It's what's called a, a pool-type reactor. So it's a, a, big, a big vessel pool. Um, it's filled with liquid sodium. So that's the main difference. These are liquid sodium reactors. So it's filled with liquid sodium. The core sits within that. And as the core does its thing and produces heat, it circulates the sodium, gets it nice and hot, and then it, there's another heat transfer ring. And then after you get through that, this is where I get a bit technical, trying to describe it without a whiteboard. Um, <laughs> then you get the steam generation. So there's the highest pressure system is actually in the steam, and the lowest pressure comes back to the vessel, which is where the containment is. So it's, it's very difficult to actually get a release. I wish I did have a whiteboard. It's so much easier. but. Happy to come back. <laughs> uh, what else? So we've spoken about, yeah, you know, the potential to actually build units in New Brunswick for other markets in Western Canada. Um, 2030, we've got a slide on the schedule. And again, we've mentioned 
that it's not just nuclear power, it's other industrial processes, so they're taking note. So that's one of two. I think the next slide is the next reactor. Oh, no, sorry. So this is where we're currently at with the ARC 100. So we're in what's called a pre-project phase. So ARC are currently going through pre-licensing design cycles with the CNSC, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. So this is a, it's a voluntary process, but it's very valuable because what it allows ARC to do is to get a lot of documentation, a lot of design documentation, a lot of safety documentation into the regulator. They start looking at it quite early. So this is prior to any of the licensing phases that, that come much later. So it's kind of getting your, getting ahead of the game essentially. So we will actually be submitting our license to prepare site, which is the first um, regulatory submission. Um, it basically covers clearing the ground, building a lay down area, maybe getting some temporary power, getting some construction huts. It's literally just to prepare um, the site for construction which occurs um, three or four years down the road as you go through all those licensing cycles. And once you submit that, um, it runs parallel with the environmental assessment. So that's literally the starting gun for the project phase. Once you, once you cross through this threshold, um, you've started down the, the proper project pathway to making it happen. So one of the, when you do a license repair site, you have to undertake um, a whole swath of studies. Um, some of them are environmental, some of them are, are geotech, understanding you know, groundwater. Um, you have to do all your studies that you understand what's happening in terms of you know, plants and animals and, and sea life, marine life, and you have to baseline all of that. You have to document it. And it's not, it's not just that, but it's also another study which is called the sustainability and well-being, and this is, this is really important because what this does is it also goes out in the community and it documents the current, um, you know, what's happening economically, what's happening socially. Um, it's an it's a, an engagement with community and the stakeholders involved, such that, you know, when we when we design our plant and we move down those those project phases, we understand the effects that this project is going to have on these community stakeholders. So it's, it's really important that we get this early engagement as well for licensing. So um, as it says here, um, evaluate the potential adver and adverse effects on social, economic, and human health co conditions. So this, I think this is where the, the current stage we're at. We're, we're just now starting to go out and get the feelers out and wanting you know, to engage communities and stakeholders, uh, um, industry that could be affected, um, obviously the indigenous groups, we need to hear their feedback as well. And so I think we've just started, I think you guys are third or fourth on the list of the communities that we've, we've come out and said, it's time, to, it's time to start talking um, and communicating about sustainability and well-being um, for the SMR project. And if, um, and if you know of anyone that has already expressed that desire to, to, to want to have that conversation, just let me or Alex know after the meeting, because that's what we're after. Um, yeah, I think we're good. Okay, so. We've got two, two reactors on the cards. One is the ARC reactor, which is a, a molten or a liquid sodium reactor. The other one we have um, that we're looking at is the Moltex reactor. Now this is a company based primarily out of the, the United Kingdom. However, this, is, this one is slightly different. Instead of using liquid sodium, it uses liquid salt. So it's um, not quite the same but not altogether different. It's still considered a Gen 4. It has a lot of the same characteristics as the ARC reactor. Um, with this one, it's two-ish years um, behind the ARC reactor, but it's got, as I said, it's got a lot of the same um, characteristics. Now, what makes this one exciting um, is its ability to reprocess fuel. So <clears throat> when you have canisters of, of can-do fuel, um, you can actually, provided you know, you know the, uh, the, the composition of that fuel, um, you can give that information to a company like Moltex and they can take that and design a facility such that they will use that, they'll work some chemistry magic that I don't understand because um, <laughs> it's just way over my head, um, and then they'll use that as the fuel 
for their reactor. So the idea is um, there's a few canisters of can do in Canada, so get a hold of that and start using that as fuel for these reactors. And then you just keep you just keep reprocessing it, which is brilliant. Really cool. Again, it's very nerdy. <laughs> but if you really want to know, let me know and I can I can get you some info. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, they're they're a little further behind ARC. Um, they're in the very prelim conceptual stages, um, but they are still starting to undertake those pre-licensing cycles um, with the CNSC. So because this one is, is quite different, it's, it's really a new thing to consider having a, a nuclear fuel reprocessing facility at Point Lepro. Um, that one will require the full federal um, impact assessment process rather than just the provincial one that we're having for the ARC unit. So um, in terms of timelines, ARC is on the top, Moltex on the bottom. Um, so mid-2023, we start, we, we pull the trigger, we're into our project phase. Um, construction sometime in 2027, and then commercial on-grid in 2031. And as you can see on the bottom, um, Moltex is lagging a couple years, um, three years it appears by the time they're actually on, on grid and commercial as well. So eight years, eight years and 11 years. Hopefully we'll have two reactors up and running. So I think I mentioned supply chain sectors as well. Um, lots of opportunity for manufacturing and assembly in New Brunswick. The second one, engineering and technology support. Um, nuclear is gonna go through what oil and gas went through about 20 years ago. It's just gonna be a massive um, knowledge sector um, shortage. Um, in the engineering and technology. Um, so when we, when we think power plant, it's not, it's not just the people that can do real, tangible, cool things. Um, it's also the knowledge sector. So lots of opportunity there. Um, and that extends as well to quality assurance, environmental safety, um, lots of regulatory um, work that I'll need to get done. I sort of see this slide and I, I think about everything that's gonna be required in terms of people power and I, I, I kind of forget, I, I think, oh my God, where are we gonna find all these people? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> lots of opportunity, I think, going forward for New Brunswick and Canada as well. And that's it, does anyone have any questions? Yes? Sir, so are you saying that uh, the Voltex Gen 4 is one that you can use, we can use spent uranium rods? Yes, they can, yeah. Recycle the old rods? Yes, the, the pellets, yep. It's. They basically, first you have to develop, you know, lots of what they call airlocks and you, and you move through a process. It's, I think it's quite robotic, obviously you want to, um, you don't want to be doing it with your hands. Um, but you basically, you pull the used fuel bundles out of fuel storage. Um, you basically mix them up, you, you mix them with other chemicals, you pull out the transuranics, um, and then you make new fuel, and then you can put that in the SMR. Um, for again a 20 year oh, we're good to go it doesn't ha it's it's the same as the arc it doesn't have that constant refueling no so they'll the, as long as it has a can do waste fuel source it can make new fuel for its reactors so there's an opportunity because there's there's not just us there's opg bruce pickering so they'll have waste can do fuel as well so it's an opportunity to reuse that fuel in other reactors so if, so if, say for example, Moltex doesn't just build in New Brunswick, but say they build either in another province or say an American jurisdiction, they can, they can export that fuel. So, and that's never been done. That is pretty cool. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? Yeah, thank you. A great presentation, by the way. Um, well, so you're, you're talking about bringing in spent, or not spent, but recycling uh, uranium in the province, but bringing it from other can-do reactors. Would storage and disposal be done in the province? So storage of, like... Once, once after the 20 years is done, sorry, and, and then you're done with the, the, the rods, would they be stored in New Brunswick? Um, long term, I don't think so, right? So at the, like, say we didn't have Moltex, and, all, and we just had can-do fuel, um, and so what's it called? The acronym is Nuclear Waste Management Organization, NWN, w, NWMO, there we go. Um, so they're currently progressing the long-term 
and by long term it's like permanent um, waste storage solution for can do now when arc when arc fuel is is spent and you can no longer do anything with it um, it's not quite the same as can do fuel in terms of composition and the way it, it's actually built like the the bundles are different size and so but they're now saying well we can we can apply the same technology, well not technology, but the same methodology, but we have to resize it, we have to, you know, do whatever calcs they need to do to say, okay, it doesn't physically look like this, which is can do, you know, long and thin, it might be something different. So how do we, how do we fabricate the long-term container? Um, and it's also, it's also a metallic fuel, um, can do is an oxide fuel, so there's different material considerations that they have to consider when they design the long-term canister to put in what's called the DGR, the Deep Geological Repository. Yeah, and if you want to know what that will likely look like, Finland is currently building its DGR. So they're well on the way. Um, I didn't know the Finns were, <laughs> but there you go. You know what I like about that? It's another small jurisdiction and they're, and they're doing something really cool. So, because I think they've only got, what, four or five million people, it's not a huge country. So that's pretty neat. Uh, Councillor, so how many uh, SMRs are we looking at for the So, for the Pointe Pro site, four arcs, and and then a Moltex unit. So, at the, if you've ever been to Lepro, it's it's quite a large site and it's got vast open space at the moment. So, we're actually really fortunate where we can actually line, essentially, two Costco's because each one's about half the size of a Costco. Um, there's a nice. Um, well, not nice, but an ideal location down the west side of the site. Because what happened in the 1980s, that construction site was humongous. It was really, really large. So when you go to the site now, there's quite a swath of no man's land. Um, it's flat, just graveled over. Um, so we're going to be able to capitalize on that area. So what we're actually going to do is going to be minimal in terms of further site degradation. It's, yeah, it's literally, you stand in the middle and it's, it, it's like, you know, again, a couple of football pitches. <laughs> it's just wide open space. So we have space for, for four. Thanks. Councillor Harlan, do you have a question? No, not anymore. Um, Councillor Blanchard. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation. I actually worked at Point Le Pro as a summer student for three three summers back uh, when I was in the university, so, so at least I'm familiar the with the site. <laughs> I'm familiar with the site. They didn't let me into the reactor very often, but uh, <laughs> but I'm familiar with the site. Um, just, uh, and you may not be able to speak to this, but you did talk about the energy uh, consumption uh, and requirements not really going down. Obviously, they're probably going to go up, but. I don't know, are you able to speak to the energy uh, efficiency programs that uh, MD Power has sort of put in place to give an idea on sort of the uptake and what impact they've had on energy demands over the last, let's say, 10, 15 years? And I'm, I'm sort of thinking, you know, can we get demand down? If we can get mm. demand down, you know, what's the requirement for new energy uh, uh, production, you know, coming online? So I, I'm not that I'm opposed to this by, by any stretch. I'm, in, I'm interested, mm. especially the idea of recycling and reusing some of that fuel. I mean, we're still going to end up with essentially something that needs long-term storage in the end, mm. even after the 20 years. Mm. The degradation and, and how does it compare to can-do can -do fuel? I'm just, I'm just interested to know, like, the requirements for, for long-term storage. Are they slightly less now that it's gone through another 20 years of processing, or are we essentially in the same boat where it needs some, some significant, uh, like you said, geological storage, right? Um, you'll still need geological storage yeah. um, for the long term. Um, not exactly sure of the the dimensions, like just in terms of volume, how much it's going to be. Um, my gut tells me that it's going to be a lot less, simply because you're not. It's not like point where you're. I've seen the fuel base at Point La Pro, and I had no idea that there was so much. I I, I didn't think it was so uh, refueling intensive until I actually uh, did the tour. Right. Um, so that was a bit of an eye opener. Um, so if this vessel. It's, it's roughly five meters tall, and it's about nine meters in diameter. The core itself um, is only a fraction of that, because even the first core that you take out to put in a new fueling core, that first core actually doesn't leave the vessel. It, it's actually stored within the vessel for another few years until it's decayed such that you can take it out and then put it in dry storage. Mm -hmm. So you're looking easily at the first 40 years, nothing is stored outside of the vessel. So 
in terms of sheer quantity, it's a fraction of what can do produces. Yeah, so I, I kind of sort of thinking along those lines too. Yeah, I've seen the images and the cameras and the shots from the the, uh, the cooling bays and all yeah. that stuff. It's there's a lot of fuel. It's, it's there's, there's a, a lot, lot of fuel, fuel there, right? Yeah. So I was interested to see what kind of an impact that would have on Canada's overall. Uh, what we have stored right now, yeah, and uh, and are cooling right now, yeah, and what kind of an impact that would have on so overall, but. in I mean, obviously, Moltex is a few years away. I actually think there's there's going to be um, a bit of a glut of used can dual fuel. I think there's going to be more than what they'll be able to recycle and market elsewhere, um, simply because there is so much. And some of the really old can do fuel might be you past its use by date because obviously you still need sufficient um, fissionable material to make the reaction work so I'm not I'm not a decay expert by any means but I do know that there's a certain point where you could probably still recycle it but you're not going to get the same um, punch yeah same bang for your buck and are you able to speak at all to the sort of the efficiency programs or is that something we can maybe get some information offline on because that would be something that I would be interested yeah. in I know we as a, as a as a council as a town have sort of moved towards looking towards energy, uh, finding efficiencies within within our, our, our community, within mm -hmm. our, our, our town municipal buildings and, and, structure, and infrastructure. Um, one of the solutions, one of the things that we did look at was, was solar production mm -hmm. and how we could sort of power or, or at least reduce some of our power costs mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions within mm -hmm. the community as well. We did find that there are some roadblocks through NB Power in terms of um, the decentralized production uh, municipalities producing their own power, things like that. Okay. Um, and again, I know uh, we've raised those concerns up through NB Power, um, but maybe, like I said, conversations offline. One last thing, though, I would so, sort of say, uh, one thing you did mention about uh, different industries being able to use this technology to mm -hmm. produce, like said, not just power, but heat, steam production. I just wonder about the implications of like how many small modular uh, reactors are we talking about, you know, popping up around the province to power different types of industry. like. There, there would have to be, I would think, some implications or maybe some concerns of multiple new reactors, mm -hmm. nuclear reactors. Still, again, I, I get what they're doing, but yeah. there, there's, yeah, I, it's, I, hopefully it's there are other ways to produce other than nuclear. I think, yeah. you know, we want to. Yeah, it's definitely right. it's definitely not all going to happen um, by Tuesday. That's right. for sure. Right. Um, so I, what I think will happen because, and I've had. Uh, discussions with other um, so o Ontario Power is one but also um, the CNSC um, CSA and they're all starting to come together and rethink this because it's always been about big huge power plants and now it's about little power plants that don't present the same risk that a big power plant does now I'm not saying we're gonna plonk one down in the middle of Toronto um, but where you do have remote mines, remote sites, um, is it such that because the risk is less, um, you don't, it's not, it's not as, um, <clears throat> like when things, when things happen, it's, it's not the same as, and, and the problem too is that everyone, everyone envisions what they see on TV. Sure. And that's not what SMRs, they're not capable of doing that. And it just comes back to the technology. Um, it comes back to um, the fact that they're, they're not under pressure. Um, I can give, the way I can explain it, it's really, really neat how it happens. So when people think of a nuclear reactor, they think of runaway, runaway radioactivity reactions and things getting out of control. Um, and you know you're unable to cool the the core and, and it just starts to, to everyone's minds run wild well what happens in this type of reactor if your reactor starts to um, the reactivity goes up so it starts producing more heat on a atomic level the, the fuel it's like you can't see it but the molecules spread apart right now the fundamental difference between a candy reactor in this one. A candy reactor, you have to have something that slows the molecules down so that they'll hit the fuel and do the reaction. In an SMR, at least this fuel, <clears throat> if you if your reaction starts increasing on that molecular, the, the the molecules start to spread apart. This fuel needs neutrons going fast to hit it, but it can't. They sail right through because it's expanded on the, on the atomic level. And when that happens, the reactor slows itself down. It will happen automatically. It's what one of the slides referred to as inherent safety. That's what we mean. It's really, like, 
I don't know how you'd get it to, to, to go out of control. Yeah, no, yeah. I appreciate it. And my, I mean, my, my concerns are more in the production of the fuel and, and what's emitted during mm. that process and also long-term uh, residuals in the storage, you know, the yeah. spent fuel, things like that. Like, those are the concerns that I have less about. Like, I, I'm confident in the safety, having mm. sort of at least spent three summers there and speaking with the engineers, speaking with the people that are in charge. I feel like the safety measures are there. It's good, yeah. solid technology that can do. Mm. I don't know as much about the SMRs, but but me to me, it's more about finding energy production that is does not emit for one, and I recognize mm. this doesn't emit, and that's a key key mm. thing for me. But also just the long term costs of it and, and uh, the other implications. But I do appreciate mm. the. Uh, mm the uh, presentation yeah. thank you and when it comes to solar so the years I spent overseas I was in Australia um, and Australia is a, a really interesting country in terms of solar because if you go through any major suburb of any major town or city the whole place every roof has rooftop solar yeah. um, so I, I don't know what the rules are in terms of municipalities installing rooftop solar but I'm looking at my house in St. George going I get you know in the summer I get 12 hours of direct sunlight why do I not have solar panels on my house yeah. um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of rooftop solar <laughs> well, so there are, we're, we're, I mean, yeah, power we're might disagree that. with that position they, but, well yeah but it, they maybe kind of do and that's but, part of the issue right but it's there, there be are part some, of the solution too right yeah, it, it there, has there to have be, to be. There it has, has to be, be. Yeah. there are some there are some there are some uh, things that hold people back from that I think there are processes that are out there that exist yeah and I think we've been pushing uh, NB power to consider some other ways to um, open the door to, yeah. to people to sort of get in like the upfront costs for for that solar are, are the, the yeah. I think the big the drawbacks for a lot of people yeah. there are ways to uh, to um, to get around those and yeah. I think yeah. we're hoping that MB power yeah. will sort of come around or, or the province will come around and make make some changes to some legislation yeah, make it thank easier you. To do thank it. you all yeah. I won't take up any more time <laughs> Yeah, I've got a couple of answers for you. <laughs> My name is Bob Scott, Director of Government Relations, Stakeholder Engagement. Excuse me, could you go to the microphone, yeah, please? Thank you, thank you very much. Sorry, but yeah. just so that we can be heard. <laughs> but uh, first of all, the, um, the, the program that we launched on September 28th with respect to the heat pumps obviously didn't take us 12 days before we were basically had, had everybody that we could possibly get into the program. And now we're going to keep it going. I mean, it's like five and a half months in, but we're going to keep that going because baseboard heating is our worst enemy, as you probably know. And these heat pumps, mini splits, basically are a lot better for everybody. It takes down our peaks. And she talked about the situation we had with 3,400 and some odd megawatts that, that we were kicking out back on February the 5th. Well, I mean, a lot of that was baseboard heating because people couldn't possibly the rest of their heating couldn't keep up with that type of thing. So that was a very costly venture for us. Now, as far as solar goes, probably nobody in this province knows about this other than the place where the actually happens. We just opened a solar farm, and uh, we, we went online last Tuesday in Shediac. And it's a very large solar farm. It's the only one in Atlantic Canada. And it's intended to produce net zero for two buildings I in that. I get that two buildings in that town, <laughs> that being the multipurpose center downtown and the federal superannuation building, which is located next door to it. So, so we, are, we are venturing into solar, and, and, we, and we can't survive without solar, obviously. Uh, there are some downsides to it, as there, as there is with wind. But overall, uh, Enemy Power is actually, it's, it's, it's very much a di very diverse uh, use of uh, different products to pro provide heat for us here in, in New Brunswick. Anyway, it's just to give you, like, we, we're, we're not, this is this is fabulous, there's no two ways about it, but we are very active in the other, other fields too. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Council, any other questions? No? I thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, very informative and very knowledgeable for, well, at least for me, I, I'm sure, uh, great wealth of knowledge there. So thank you very much for doing that and for coming. So now we move on, right? So. Uh, the next thing we have, Council, is the approval of the minutes of the previous meetings. And as the Mayor runs quite through them fat quickly, so will I. 
So the first one is the minutes of 230206 regular council meeting on Monday, February the 6th, 2023 at 630 p.m. The motion is that the minutes for this regular 230206 regular council meeting on Monday, February the 6th, 2023 at 630 p.m. be adopted. So I need a first, uh, first person, uh, ben uh, Councillor Bennett, seconder, Councillor Hurdle. Uh, is there any additions or anything, omissions? Okay, here's the question. All those in favor of accepting the minutes for the 230206 regular council meeting on February um, the 6th, 2023, say aye. Aye. Contrary minded? Carried unanimously. All right, moving right along. Minutes of the 2302-21 regular council meeting on Tuesday, February the 21st, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. That the minutes of this of the 230221 regular council meeting on Tuesday, February 21st, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. be adopted. And I need a firster. Councillor Harland, seconder. Councillor Bennett. Any errors or omissions? Not seeing any. I'll call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, contra minded? Carried unanimously. And the last one. Uh, minutes of the 230227 special council meeting on Monday, February the 27th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. And the motion is this, that the minutes of this, of the 2302-27 special council meeting on Monday, February the 27th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. be adopted. I need a firster, Councillor Harland, second, Councillor um, Blanchard. I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye, and contra minded? Carried unanimously. So that is our minutes. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there was any communications with there, Mr. Knopper, so no communications. So we're on to staff reports. Councillor, um, no, sorry, Mr. Spear. Thank you, Worship. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, thank you. March has certainly roared in like a line as we had three significant snowfalls within a week. The seasons certainly seem to be shifting, but onward we go. On behalf of staff, we appreciate the opportunity to discuss the ongoing affairs of the town. Both council staff and citizens are delighted that our new manager of recreation, Mervyn Henselpacker, who started last week, He's looking forward to reaching out to user groups and the community to create an inventory of existing facilities and programs and to identify community needs. One of the last issues before you, uh, sorry, one of the issues before you is a visioning exercise for the Charlotte County Courthouse. Since the town accepted the facility in 2018, there has been only been incremental use there were initial discussions on potential uses with the council of the day, but no concrete plans have been established. Staff proposes that we hire a consultant who has vast experience in heritage properties to do a community engagement and report back to council on what the community feels is appropriate. Last meeting, and again tonight, there is discussion around the pilot project for the hop-on, hop-off bus being proposed by Huntsman Marine Science Center. Although there are no tax dollars going into the project, the proponent has been open to suggestions coming from council staff and the general public. With the facilitator assisted priority setting session coming up in April, local residents should be talking to one of your councillors about any thoughts and opinions. These sessions are primarily focused on larger initiatives that will affect the community for years to come. Under administrative, it appears the cost of construction is higher than anticipated for in-ground services. The first project out of the gate was approximately 12% over the budgeted amount. From our understanding, there have been several projects that have gone over the winter, so contractors are not aggressively seeking work, which is reflective in the price. 
The second tender will be opened by the reading of this report and give us a better picture of where the total project costs are going. Staff recommends awarding the project on the agenda tonight and we will provide a further update at the next meeting. We are working with other levels of government to review the refurbishment of the wharf and assist by providing us with additional funding. Engineers are still pricing the repairs to the approach in order to lift the weight instructions in a few months uh, and we'll get back to us and that is the uh, funding partners uh, and their decision were reviewed to us. S staff has started the process of updating the signage to key attraction locations in the downtown area. We are reviewing it in-house and will forward it to key stakeholder groups for further input. That said, we would like to wrap this process up, up by late March so we can get the signs ordered and installed by the Victoria Day weekend. One of our staff who is replacing water meters is out for several weeks to several months due to an injury. Public Works is assisting, but with the recent snow, they can spare few bodies. We are hoping to do consumption billing this fall, but it may be delayed until next spring. In order to start it, the starting value of the meters needs to be read this March and April. One of the initiatives we undertook a couple of years ago is to come up with a community energy strategy under Quest Canada Accelerator Program. They are finalizing an economic impact assessment document and then we'll be able to present the final document in the spring to council. Uh, on a side note, one of the projects that I've been involved in is testing a new budget portal that will allow the electronic submission of documents to the government of New Brunswick and should eventually allow for better data gathering and comparisons. There are 20 to 25 individuals involved in the project on behalf of the government of New Brunswick with the hopes of having it live this fall. The actual portal will only used by staff, but will produce reports and hopefully increase productivity for treasurers and their staff services. As part of our ongoing professional development, three members of our staff are taking the certified asset manager training as sponsored by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. It is quite in depth, 50 hours of reading and assignments, but should provide valuable tools for the employees participating as well as for the town. In the planner's report, it has been noted an appeal was filed for the decision the PRAC made regarding a lobster holding facility at the end of St. Andrews North Road. The decision was made prior to the local government reform date of January the 1st. First, it needs to be noted that the planner's responsibility is to rationalize the decision of the PRAC. We have not been asked about council's position, but normally you try to keep out of the decisions of the planning committee. And that's been in my report, I guess. Thank you, Mr. Spear. All right. So that brings us to, oh no. Then, uh, so now we need to approve uh, the staff reports, right? So I need a first and seconder, please. Yep. First, Councillor Neal, seconder. Councillor Hurdle, I think. All right, so um, is there any further discussion? Councillor Harlan? So Chris, just to clarify, um, although that's the planner's responsibility to rationalize the decision of PRAC, and normally council doesn't um, get involved in the decisions. Does that preclude us from being involved? Can we, um, so my concern is that um, this decision was made two months prior to uh, reform and it has huge impacts for our residents. So is there a, an ability for us to weigh in, in in this discussion, to have some input, to express some concerns, to talk to our 
to talk to our residents? I'll, I'll have to review because it's an unusual situation. The primary reason councils don't normally get involved is because they're appointing the body itself and so it creates um, issues between council and the board if they're politically interfering in something that's supposed to be a technical advisory body. But this is a special circumstance. Um, the as opposed to the process that the PRAC would have gone through, which is open discussion, the appeals board tends to be just between the proponent, or the, proponent the people making the appeal, and uh, the planners who are just discussing what was brought up at the meeting. I honestly can't answer whether or not how you'd communicate it, but I think if council wants to discuss it in the short term, that we, at next meeting, for instance, that we could at least get ready and talk to the planners if they could, a letter could be supplied by us. But again, typically once it goes out of the public domain to the next level, um, outside interveners aren't usually brought in. But again, this is a very unique circumstance that uh, I'll get some advice from the planners and even the appeals board about what the best course of action is. Thanks, I appreciate that because I think this is a really significant issue that has implications for us as a town. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Spear, and thank you, Councilor Harkin, Har Har Harlan, for uh, bringing that forth. Uh, anything else, Councilor Bennett? I'd like to add to that, uh, Mr. Spears, uh, that uh, I believe that we certainly should uh, uh, send a letter expressing our disconcern in the fact that the PRAC did not follow their own rules in approving that, and that uh, whether we, we agree with the the, the building, building permit approval or not is irrelevant. The fact that the PRAC is supposed to follow a set of rules and they did not follow that set of rules in implementing their approval of that, uh, of that proposal is what we should be most concerned of, besides the fact that there's many residents that are very upset about the situation and spending a lot of money fighting the, the process. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. So, that being said, can we uh, now vote on the recommended motion, which is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews accept the staff reports and the financial reports as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary-minded? None. So carried unanimously. All right. Now we are on to the introduction and consideration and passing of bylaws and motions. And I have asked Councillor Harlan to take my place as I've stepped into the mayor's place. Thank you very much, Councillor Harlan, by the way. Finance and administration. Great. So this is reference number FA230311. Submitted by Deputy Mayor Akaji. And the subject is Anglophone School District uh, request for annual turnaround awards for students. And the background is as follows. The Anglophone South School District has sent a request for funding to the Town of St. Andrews to support the annual turnaround awards for students. The event recognizes middle and high school students from Charlotte County for making significant changes in their lives, either through academics, attendance, or behavior. This is an opportunity to celebrate the success of students. The event will be taking place on Tuesday, May 9th, 2023 at Dominion Hill. There are two recipients selected from Sir James Dunn Academy, one high school level student and one middle school level student that will receive an award. Please see the attached letter for more information. The Anglophone School District is requesting $200 per student from the Town of St. Andrews to support the event. This will cover the sponsorship of the student plus two guests to attend. The Town of St. Andrews has provided funding for this event each year from the Community Assistance Grant Fund. The Mayor attends the event to present awards and support the local student award winners. So the motion is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews supports the Anglophone School District 2023 Turnaround Awards for two Sir James Dunn Academy students at a, don at a donation of 400 from the Community Assistance Grant Funds. And it's moved by myself, 
Thank you, Councillor Harland. I need a seconder. Councillor Weir. Any other f discussion? And I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary minded, it's carried unanimously. <coughs> Thank you, Car Councillor Harland, for, fi for filling in for me. And now we're on to Public Works, which is uh, Councillor Blanchard, I believe. Thank you, Worship. Uh, so, reference number PW230311. Uh, subject is the tender of TSA2023-01 sidewalk tractor. So the background, as part of the 2023 capital budget, Council budgeted $283,000, it's HST rebate included, towards the purchase of a sidewalk tractor with snow removal attachments. The Town of St. Andrews <coughs> issued tender 2023-01 sidewalk tractor on Friday, January 13th, 2023, with a follow-up addendum provided on Friday, February the 17th, 2023, before closing before the closing date for tenders on Friday, February 24th, 2023. Although we had three tender submissions, two of them did not meet the conditions of the tender and had to be rejected. The remaining tender by Saunders Equipment Limited has, has a submitted price of $214,789, uh, sorry, $214,789.50 after trade-in plus HST. This tender is below budget. Uh, staff recommends awarding tender TSA 2023-01 sidewalk tractor to Saunders Equipment Limited. And the motion that is before council, uh, that the council of the town of St. Andrews awards tender TSA 2023-01 sidewalk tractor to Saunders Equipment Limited in the net amount of $214,789.50 plus HST and ISO move. Thank you, Councillor Blanchard. I need a seconder. Councillor Neal. Any further discussion on this? Councillor Gumichel. <clears throat> Thank you, Worship. I had understood that when we were buying a new uh, a new tractor that uh, that would we'd have a, a third one and we might be able to uh, plow some trails I didn't realize we were uh, trading it in thanks for your comment councillor Grimmichel uh, any further discussion okay I'll call for the question all those in favor say aye, aye. contrary minded carry unanimously so that brings us to the next one councillor Blanchard sure thank you worship uh, so reference number PW230310 uh, is a tender TSA2023-02 Queen Street Water Main Renewal and Washroom Site Service. So as part of the 2023 Capital Utility Budget, Council budgeted $244,000, HST rebate included, for the replacement of water and sewer mains on Queen Street from Harriet Street to Mary Street. Also included in the tender were the services for the proposed washroom at Indian Point Park. The Town of St. Andrews issued tender 2023-02, Queen Street Water Main Renewal and Washroom Site Service on Thursday, February the 9th, 2023. We had four contractors submit for the tender. The tender closed on Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. Uh, please see uh, the attached bid summary document from CBCL Limited for details on the bids submitted. The lowest bid for the tender came in at $277,000, HST included, but when you remove the HST rebate and add back the engineering fees, the expected cost of the project is $273,000. The lowest bid tender is $29,000 over budget. At this <coughs> time, staff would recommend awarding this tender. We have two more tenders to be released in the next three weeks. If the cost of the second tender is over budget, we may recommend delaying the third project for another year. There is also the potential to use more gas tax funds or utility capital reserve funds to cover the overrun. And the motion is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews awards tender TSA 2023-02 Queen Street Water Main Ren Renewal and Washroom Site Services to MIDI Construction in the amount of 270000 $277,914.75 HST included and I so move. Thank you, Councillor Blanchard. Could I have a seconder, please? Councillor Bennett, just by hair. Um, any further discussion? 
Seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Contrary mind, <coughs> it's carried unanimously. Okay, so the next one is public safety and Councillor Neal, you have nothing. So we'll move on to business, tourism, heritage and culture. Culture, that's Councillor <coughs> Hurdle. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is in reference to BTHC 230302. Uh, the subject is the Charlotte County Courthouse engagement process. So background is the, the town of St. Andrews is seeking to identify a long-term vision for the Charlotte County Courthouse. Due to the limited use of the facility and the ongoing costs associated, council should determine the public's <coughs> input on the future of these facilities. To accomplish this task, staff is recommending the hiring of William Bill Hicks of Broken Shovel Consulting to lead and conduct the visioning exercise. Mr. Hicks has an extensive background in heritage facilities and management, including being the director of the heritage branch of the new, of, sorry, of the government of New Brunswick and the chief executive officer of the New Brunswick Museum. Please see the attached staff report and background information on the proposed consultant. Staff is seeking council's approval uh, to move forward with the visioning exercise. As this project is unbudgeted for 2023, funds can come from the initial grant given to the town to help offset the costs of the property. And the motion before us is that the Council of Ta the Town of St. Andrews approves the hiring of William Hicks of Broken Shovel Consulting to conduct a visioning exercise for the Charlotte County Courthouse at a cost of $7,000 with funds to come from the initial grant provided by the province of New Brunswick. And I so move. Thank you, Councillor Hurdle. Do I have a seconder, please? Councillor Gumashell. Any further discussion, Council? Councillor Harland. Thank you. So I, I read um, Mr. Um, Hicks's resume, and I agree. He certainly he seems to have a, an extensive resume. But do we? Has he done? Are we aware of any consulting that he's done in the past? <clears throat> because this seems to be a, a more specific um, uh, skill set. Um, and I, I, having used consultants before, I'm just hoping that we're, we're going to be sure we're going to get a product at the end. Uh, Mr. Spear, can you respond? Yeah. So, so Mr. Hicks has actively, since his retirement from, from the provincial civil service, has been doing consulting. Um, to be perfectly honest, I've used him or I've had dealings with him, so I had full confidence in him, but I didn't follow up. Um, with any of his clients to see their satisfaction. I do know that some local communities are currently using him and that he actually has a project ongoing in the town of St. Andrews outside of us. Okay. So um, if council wishes to table it, I can do a little more digging. I, I, I appreciate that and uh, get back to you on, on some references and things if you like. Uh, I'm comfortable with that if you are aware of uh, other projects that he's been involved in from a consulting perspective. I'm comfortable with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Councillor Hurdle? I, I would actually uh, move to table this just if I could see some more experience um, from a consultant point of view and, and some feedback, especially since he's asking for funds up front. Uh, I think it would behoove us just to make sure that there is a, a, a track record of success. This is a, a sensitive building with a lot of heritage and importance for the community. I want to make sure that it's uh, done properly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hurdle. So, uh, do we finish this motion? Do we table it first? You have a se seconder. Okay, for we have a seconder, Councillor Gomeshell. You missed it. No, you need a seconder for the motion. Oh, table. for the table motion. So, Sorry. Councillor Hurdle's motion. So, Councillor Hurdle is, has motion to table this. I need a seconder. Sorry, Council. Councillor Bennett. Any further discussion about tabling it? That's one we have to vote on first, correct? All right, so uh, to table it, uh, all those in favor say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six. Carried <laughs> unanimously. So this is tabled. Do we need to do this the other motion because this has been tabled? No, you were oh, right. I'm sorry. Yep. Contrary minded. Yep. Councillor Blanchard. Sorry, I missed you. It's because I didn't look to my left. Okay, hold on. Contrary. Councillor Van. So, but still carried, not unanimously, but 
six to one, correct? No, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six to one. Thank you. All right. Blanchard. All right. Thank you, Council. And we have one more left. That's Councillor Bill Michelle. Thank you, Worship. Best for last. Oh. Your Worship, you still have Section 2 of the update Sorry. on the Hudson Marine. Oh, I skipped that, too. So, Councillor Hurdle, you have a second part. Yes, yep, date of the Huntsman. Page. Should be in there. If you're looking at the page, look 87. 87. I don't have it on mine. It Our should package. be page 86 and 87. It should be in your package. 86. Oh, yes, it is. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no motion with this council. It's just the just discussion report for you. Okay. It's on the hop on, hop off bus. About the hop on, hop off bus. So, Councillor um, uh, Mr. Dopper, would you like to speak on this on sure, behalf of Councillor? Sure, Hurdle? Your Worship. So, thank you very much. Uh, staff did meet with the representatives of the Huntsman Marine Science Center last week uh, in discussions based on the council feedback and uh, some public feedback that came in as well. Uh, as you see, you have been presented with a new option of the concept of their route. Uh, what they are proposing now, instead of going up through the residential area uh, along Montague Street, they're actually prepared to go along Water Street and have actually two stops uh, that are proposed. So they are listed there. One is uh, they're still working with the Talb at this point for some funding to do a stop near um, Elizabeth Street Pocket Park. But then they are looking to have a stop uh, at the other end near Prince, uh, Princess Royal Street. So that would give two stops at either end of the historic business district while still maintaining the, the rest of the route that was presented. So uh, they did take the feedback from council on that and, and added actually a, a couple of spots. So that really focused in the downtown. Um, and then to note, uh, council asked for some information back on data gathering. So they are going to have a clicker system in place that'll measure number of riders. Now, not necessarily residents versus tourist riders, uh, but they are prepared to work with us to do a survey out to see what other information we can get uh, and feedback on the bus program and service. And then financials council asked about. So uh, explained in the report there, you can see that the project's basically a $5,000 project for the 28 days of service that, this, uh, that the bus would be operational. Uh, they'd be operating 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, July and August, Friday, Saturday, uh, Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays. And then so subsequently, they asked all the major players that are participating to basically take a, a quarter, if not a little bit more of the of the chunk to, to make it happen, uh, as well as noted in the report that the, the bus that the Huntsman has. This doesn't actually talk about their cost of the financials of the bus, the full maintenance of it and everything like that, which is uh, a part of their business model because they are trying to drive business to them. So they, they understand that process and, and, are, and we're open to uh, running and operating this as uh, with partners. So you've got the Huntsman Marine Science Center, Kingsbury Garden, Algonquin Hotel, uh, the Kiwanis Club of St. Andrews, Explore St. Andrews potential by looking like it's positive in that way. And then, uh, as always, th there's no tax dollars going into this. It's a lot of it's through them. Even the Huntsman said they would be willing to purchase the signs. It's more staff working with council on getting bus stops into the bylaws and then basically subsequently getting the, the stops put in place. So from all intents and purposes, that was the information that council wanted back prior to moving forward with the hop on, hop off. So back to you, council, unless CAO Spear, you. you've got any follow up. Thank you, Mr. Knopper. CAO Spear, do you have something to add? No, I'd just like to reiterate too, that's only running three to four days a week and for four to five hours a day. So there's a question about what impede traffic and stuff. So it's very much a pilot project in year one with a limited use. So we'll be happy to see the intake and, uh, and the number of residents before potentially expanding it or even expanding the model to become as much a public transportation hub as it is right now, kind of the, the movement of tourist hub in its initial plan by the Huntsman. So I have a question, but I'll, Council, do you have any questions? Uh, Councillor Gromichel? Just one, one thing that jumps out is the, uh, it starts on Thursdays at noon, and, and that seems a little late for the market. If, uh, open, if they started out a little earlier in the day, it'd probably be, uh, be better for everyone. 
Uh, Council, Council, just on that. So they noted to us that a lot of their summer programming, their, their, the, the transportation is used on other days to take students to other sectors. And the, the times that they indicated to us that they had the bus available were the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So um, hard to argue when it's their business model. And But, but we did present. But I, I will note that multiple submissions have come in, not just for... Uh, for, for other days, but for longer into the evenings, for other routes and locations. So uh, I think there's a buzz in the community about it, and it'd be inter it's going to be interesting to see how well the, the pilot takes over for, for the community. Okay, any other councillor? I have a question. Um, are we able to see this bus? Like, you tell us it's an 11-passenger bus. I'd like to see it physically see it is it here is it at Huntsman the, are we the, able to go visit a, what is this it, it's at the Huntsman and uh, I'm sure we can arrange a, a viewing for council to, to see the bus um, is it wheelchair accessible or not N to my knowledge not wheelchair okay, accessible thank you that's the other question I had uh, councillor Blanchard thank you worship uh, just to town staff have you had the opportunity yet then or are you able to sort of look in I know we talked about of uh, funding dollars up from either provincial or federally um, for rural municipalities or just uh, in, in, in for transportation in general mm -hmm. have you been able to sort of or do you have a sense of what might be available I just sort of do in the sort of the back of the envelope numbers here I think based on and I, and I realize this is rough costs and it doesn't take into account it's their bus maintenance costs are not being incorporated into this project this is just a pilot but just based on those numbers and um, I think if it works out to about two hundred and six dollars roughly a day, and then if we factor that, I'm just thinking beyond the pilot project. Mm -hmm. If we were looking at a 12 month of the year service, um, whether it's on the same type of schedule or reduced schedule for portions of that, um, probably around thirty five, thirty six thousand dollars based on just those numbers. I think that's sort of what I'm calculating out. Again, we're keeping it a three-day or possibly a four-day service that we provide, that the town provided throughout the year. I'm just wondering, is there an opportunity to sort of look at, you know, what what it would be what would be required to get some kind of uh, uh, public transportation in this area to to help residents uh, of our community? So, so I'm going to ask Mr. Knopper or Mr. Spear to respond, please. Yeah. Uh, so through you, Your Worship, so one of the main funds that's out there and available now is the Rural Transit Fund through the federal government. It's got about $15 billion of funding available for rural communities to develop rural transit systems. Now, if that's a strategy that Council wants us to pursue, like I've, I've read up on the grant and understand the processes of what needs to be applied, so as well to give you an idea, the Rural Transit Fund was how the Eastern Charlotte Waterway was able to get their Project Village vehicles up from that and they got almost a $500,000 grant so and that was for over a five-year period if I'm not mistaken so there are opportunities based on what the federal government has out there right now for rural transit I haven't looked at from a provincial standpoint from what uh, RDC might have uh, to subsequently sub support programs like that but at least there is a federal pot of money that could be looked at if that is a priority of council Okay, thank you, Mr. Ms. Council Blanchard. No, I think that's it. Like I said, it would be it would make sense for this council to sort of consider what we would like to see in in the community. Um, obviously, some public consultation would be nice as well, just to get a sense of what the community needs are. Um, but uh, knowing that that pot of money is there and there are some options perhaps available to us, I think that would be good going forward. Perhaps our our, our strat strategic planning session would be a, an opportunity to to put out some uh, ideas. And Thank you, Councilor. If you worship. Oh, yes. If, if, Mr. Sorry, Spear? if I may, too. I just want to remind everybody that one of the new pillars of the RSC is a public transportation committee that's just getting underway. And um, I know we talk about all this money, but for, the, for a town our size, the reality of, of big dollars investments coming in to run our own bus are, are probably minimal. Um, so I think it's important that we collaborate with other communities to find a model that will support uh, as many as we can in the region, but it's also an opportunity to uh, collaborate on funding to look at these studies and, and try to find out how we can make this model work um, for the benefit of, of many people. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spear. Council uh, Blanchard, does that answer your question? 
Uh, Councilor Bennett, sorry. So I just want to let Council know, uh, just today, uh, Mr. Knopper uh, forwarded me uh, an invitation to attend a conference in Freighton on the 23rd and 24th of March on public transportation. So I registered for that uh, symposium today. Uh, once that's over, I will present a report to Council on all the subjects that you're talking about now are all topics for the symposium. So I'll report after the conference is over. Thank you, Councillor <coughs> Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Knopper. Okay. So uh, now, Councillor Gumashal. Thank you. Try again. Uh, <laughs> Take two. Last thing on the uh, agenda tonight is uh, RCS 230306, submitted by myself, and the subject is the appointment of manager of recreation for the town of St. Andrews. And the background reads, Staff and Council have completed the hiring process to fill the new position of Manager of Recreation for the Town of St. Andrews. We are proud to introduce Mr. Mervyn Henselpacker as the new Manager of Recreation. Mr. Henselpacker has a strong background in developing programming, event hosting, and customer service. His most recent role was working as a program coordinator at the YMCA of Greater St. John Blacks Harbor Division. As part of the municipal process, Council can appoint Mr. Henselpacker to the to the position of Manager of Recreation. He has started his position with the town as of Monday, February 27th, 2023. And the motion is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews appoints Mr. Mervyn Henselpacker as the Manager of Recreation for the Town of St. Andrews. Moved by myself. Thank you, Councillor Gumschel. Seconded by Councillor Weir. Further discussion, Council? I hope he stays longer than 60 days. Somebody nail his feet to the floor. <laughs> okay, I'll ask for the question then. All those in favor say aye. aye. Contrary minded? Carried unanimously. So, Council, that brings us to new business. Oh, there's no planning and economic development. Councillor Heenan, he got offered lightly this week. New business, is there any? No new Councilor business. Knopper? Uh, Mr. Knopper, sorry. So we're into question period. Any questions from the floor? No? no. Get warm? <laughs> okay. I'm glad that you've asked a few more questions on it. I have heard that um, uh, can you go to the microphone, please? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. And can you introduce yourself? Please? Yes. So we're going to cut you all again. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hi, uh, James Deneau at 228 Montague Street. Uh, we own the Chase House, which is the corner of Frederick and Montague, which is across from the courthouse. Uh, my only question tonight was, you know, what is the long-term vision of the courthouse? I know that we've hired or are thinking of hiring a consultant. Um, the Chase House was built 150 years ago by the deputy sheriff of this town walked to every court case across the street at that courthouse so it's you know obviously a significant our house is a significant structure as is the courthouse as a national historic site so um i'm i like that we're hiring someone uh, to do an assessment on the future so it is a national historic site it shouldn't just be sitting there vacant but do we have an idea on what the outcomes of such an a uh, such a study will be i guess is my question Count, uh, Mr. Spear, or Mr. Knopper, do you have a response? Yeah, it's, it's the purpose of the study, Mr. Journal, is to figure out what the community is willing to accept. Um, we, it isn't for them to come in and dictate what they think it should be mm -hmm. for. It's to sit with the community and see what the vision internally is. And we've, we've tried to do that exercise in the past with little success. And so we're looking for someone to come in as a consultant who can organize it that Hopefully there'll be a strong opinion provided of what direction council should go and uh, and the steps to get there. Okay, great. Uh, and I will say, um, I, my knowledge is he is a new consultant, uh, but I sit on the board at King's Landing with a colleague of his, and I did ask the question when I saw this. Wonderful. <laughs> so, and she, she gave him glowing reviews. Uh, he is quite you know uh, knowledgeable and dedicated to heritage preservation and, and knowledgeable. I don't know what his consulting history is, but um, I just wanted to share that. So, thank you anyway. very much for sharing okay. that. Thank you very wonderful much. Knowledge. Thank you, and thank you for being here tonight. 
Any questions from the computer? Uh, for those in attendance on Zoom, do you have any questions for council on tonight's agenda? Please raise your hand. Last call, if you have a question for council, please raise your hand. Good to go with no. Oh, thank you, Mr. Knopper. Um, Councillor, it is now your opportunity for Councillor and Deputy Mayor's comments. Oh, I like that. Uh, do you have any comments to make tonight? Don't all jump at once. All right, I do. <laughs> Uh, the mayor is in Florida, so I'm glad he's finally taken a week off and allowed me the opportunity to be your mayor tonight. So thank you, unless he's on the phone watching and he's not supposed to be. Um, I want to wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day because we won't be meeting uh, on TV to say hello. Um, and I'd like to thank the SJDA uh, school for hosting a Kairos blanket exercise for students, which will be on March 17th. Uh, I have an elder that's coming from Pabano First Nations, uh, Constance, and we are going to do the Kyers Blanket exercise for the students of grade nine through 12. And then on Saturday, we will do a one for the district of uh, Anglophone School District South, and we tried to host it in, in uh, November, and unfortunately it didn't happen, so we're going to try again on the 18th of March. So I thank the Sir James and Academy for hosting it. Um, and the Anglican Parish Hall, Parish is having an extravaganza on March the 17th, um, raising money for the VMES breakfast program. And I'm sorry, Nancy Carson, that I can't remember everything else because I'm getting old. New dishwasher, uh, the youth ministry, chess group, and I would like to say congratulations to Vicki and Patrick for getting married on Saturday. It was a quick, fast marriage, and they are now married, so congratulations to you. And the last thing I want oh, I, is that they're having Lenten breakfast at the Anglican Parish Hall, and this Sunday it is French toast and sausage, and that's thank you to Ada and Carl Wood who do the cooking and preparation and all of that, but to the Anglican Church as well because the, their workers work and to Linda Walsh, who helps organize, and everybody else who participates. So thank you very much. They are trying to raise money for the new dishwasher, which is fantastic. So those are my comments, and I thank you all for listening through them. Anybody else now? Oh, Councillor Weir. Uh, just one quick question. You mentioned an elder from the Pabano First yes. Nation. Con Constance Sewell. Oh, Constance. She's the daughter of Gilbert Sewell. Yeah, I know. And a good friend. Thank you. Uh, so in the mayor's comments, that was me. And we have to go into close. Oh, sorry, <coughs> Councillor Bennett, I'm so sorry. I, no, it's, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, ask uh, a question, I guess, to, uh, to staff. Uh, I understand uh, over the past few days, uh, there have been uh, calls with concerns to uh, bylaw enforcement in, uh, in the outlying areas in the former LSDs. And I understand that those people have been directed to contact uh, the uh, RSC with their complaints, and it's not being dealt with by Talon's people. Um, I guess uh, if, if for the next up to year plus, uh, in an absence of bylaws in the uh, former LSDs, if uh, Talon are going to direct people to uh, contact the uh, the RSCs with their complaints. Uh, we should at least uh, track those complaints and uh, get a sit rep on uh, how they're being handled um, and if they're being handled. As I'm not aware right now that the RSC actually has uh, the capability to uh, even uh, enforce any of the former bylaws uh, that did exist in the, the former LSDs. So uh, staff, if you could uh, enlighten me on that uh, or the, the, the citizens of Shamcook and Bayside, I think we'd all certainly appreciate uh, some some insight on that issue. Uh, Mr. Spear or Mr. Nopper? Yeah, it's complicated, uh, Councillor Bennett. I'll have to do a little bit, but th the truth is the bylaw enforcement team in town can enforce all the bylaws within St. Andrews. Uh, the provincial laws that were in place in the old LSDs were handled by various departments, and so it depends on the nature of the complaint and about who you go to see. And the RSC 
might have answers, but they don't actually have active bylaw enforcement outside of land planning and building inspection and things. So I know that I've been getting some calls. So I'm going to sit down and talk to the local LSD manager and start calling around to some departments and see exactly who's responsible for what, because it's quite mud muddy to say the least. And uh, even with this local government reform change, some of the departments themselves are trying to figure out who's responsible for what. So we will follow up and, and have a staff report by the next uh, council meeting about exactly what is enforceable out there. But as we've said, the old bylaws of the town currently only go to the old limits of the town, so the Clark Farm Road. And uh, beyond that, it, it's uh, a, a different departments that are responsible for different portions of it. Thank you, Mr. Spear. Is that answer your uh, question? Thank you, Mr. Spears. Uh, but I do want to point out uh, for someone who just got my tax bill in the mail today, uh, on the heading it actually says uh, St. Andrews. And I understand that that's, uh, that's not your doing, but for all the citizens who uh, this week uh, open up their tax bills and see the, uh, the headline of being titled St. Andrews, uh, we can certainly expect that any comments or concerns are going to be headed to uh, town office, the town people, yourself and uh, Mr. Knopper there. So uh, we certainly have to have a means of, to, to deal with the citizens that have a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Spear. Uh, we have to move into closed session, mm -hmm. so I need to know the numbers. I didn't have it before. So Do you have it? Do you want to read if it yourself? If you worship, if you're good, I'll read just the motion Thank you and then very we can much. go from there. So at 8.25 p.m., that council moves into closed session as per Section 68.1J, Labor and Employment Matters, including the negotiation uh, of collective agreements. Thank you. Uh, I need a first and a seconder. First, Councillor Neal. Seconder, Councillor Blanchard. Blanchard. And the, here's the question. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. So that's carried unanimously. And so we are into closed session. We'll give a few, the people a few minutes to clear out. That would be CHCOTAV. Thank you very much, CHCO-TV, for covering this tonight. Recording Especially stopped. Vicki on her honeymoon. <laughs>